So uh, I would now like to invite back to the stage um, my friend, our leader, our very own Mr. President, the uh, President and CEO of the Renewable Fuels Association, Jeff Cooper, to give us the State of the Industry Address. Thanks, Neil, and uh, good morning again. I, I got to be honest, I'm still kind of uh, floating on, on cloud nine after uh, uh, the, having the opportunity to sit down with President Bush this morning. Uh, and President Bush, of course, talked about uh, the important role that, that, that his father played in his life and some of the lessons he learned from his dad. Uh, so I thought it was only fitting that I would start uh, my presentation here this morning with, with a lesson that I learned from my dad. And I was probably uh, 13 or 14 years old when dad decided that I was old enough to cut hay by myself. And so he turned me loose in one of the alfalfa fields in an old New Holland windrower like this one. Uh, and I know some of the farmers in the audience probably call this machine a swather. Uh, but from uh, where I grew up, this is a windrower. And I must admit I was more than a little nervous when I started my first pass across the field without dad or anybody else in the cab with me. And uh, dad had already cut the borders on the field, and of course they were perfectly straight and, and true. Uh, so of course I was really worried about leaving perfectly straight windrows too. And I was so worried in fact that I couldn't stop myself from constantly looking out the back window to see if the rows behind me were straight. And the problem with looking behind you of course is that you're not paying attention to what's happening in front of you. Uh, you can't see what's coming at you. You can't see if you're lined up correctly. And I learned that lesson the hard way. Uh, every time I would turn from looking behind me to briefly looking out the front window, I would see that I was heading off course and that I would overcorrect. And then my urge to look behind me would take over again and this vicious cycle just continued and, and repeated itself. And the more I looked backward, the worse things got. And by the time I got to the edge of the field, I had left a terribly crooked windrow in my wake. And this went on for another couple passes across the field before my dad finally waved me down and I think he probably gave me one of these. And uh, so I shut things down and he climbed up on, in the cab and said, look, son, you're going about this all wrong. He said, you have got to keep your focus ahead of you. If you want to stay straight, you have to know where you're going. You need to pick a point on the horizon then get everything lined up and go. And he said, sure, you got to look behind you once in a while. You got to look out that back window to make sure that you're leaving a good straight windrow for the baler. But the real key to making hay is keeping your focus forward. And so I didn't know it at the time, but that little short conversation taught me a valuable lesson, uh, not just about cutting hay, but about life and about business. And so when RFA staff got together and we were discussing possible themes for this year's conference, uh, somebody suggested focus forward. And I immediately thought of that story and its moral and its relevance for, for those of us in the ethanol industry. So to be sure, 2019 was a difficult year for the industry, one of the worst we've ever had. To get through it, we had to stay focused and we had to keep moving toward that light at the end of the tunnel. We had to keep going. After six straight years of growth, U.S. ethanol production fell in 2019. At 15.8 billion gallons, last year's output was down 300 million gallons from the record achieved in 2018. And it was even below 2017's production volume. In fact, 2019 marked just the third time in the last three decades where output fell from the preceding year. The two previous decreases annual in annual output in 1996 and 2012 were both tied to historic droughts, short crops, and record high corn prices. And even though farmers did experience some extremely challenging weather conditions last year, we can't blame the 2019 decrease in ethanol production on drought or flooding or any other natural disaster. No, the drop in, in output last year was caused by a disaster of an entirely different sort policy uncertainty, bureaucratic meddling, and vexing marketplace barriers. 
We expected that the renewable fuel standard and burgeoning export markets would continue to drive the incremental demand growth that our industry has become so accustomed to over the past few decades. We planned for growth, you invested in growth, but it simply did not materialize in 2019. Instead, we saw demand stagnation as EPA secretly doled out dozens of new RFS compliance waivers to small refineries and protracted trade wars wiped out export opportunities. EPA's illegal small refinery exemptions eroded domestic ethanol demand and hampered the expansion of E15 and flex fuels like E85. After handing out 54 waivers from the 2016 and 2017 RFS requirements, EPA turned a deaf ear to the outcry in farm country and in August doled out another 31 compliance waivers from the 2018 standards. So in total, the Trump administration has granted 85 exemptions and erased just over 4 billion gallons of RFS blending obligations. Meanwhile, protectionist trade barriers continued to shut ethanol exports out of the Chinese market and reduce shipments to Brazil. China was a top three export market for ethanol in 2016. They imported 200 million gallons that year. And it was a top 10 market in both 2017 and 2018. But in 2019, exports to China completely evaporated as escalation of the trade war and a 70% tariff slammed the door completely shut. And at the same time, Brazil's tariff rate quota on US ethanol imports, which was supposed to expire in August, but was instead extended, led to a 32% drop in shipments to that market in 2019. So overall, U.S. ethanol exports fell by 220 million gallons, or 13%, from the record level achieved in 2018. And while our exports sagged, imports jumped to a six-year high in 2019. <laughs> and to be clear, Brazilian sugarcane ethanol remained economically uncompetitive with U.S. corn ethanol. But the combination of a record high LCFS credit price, dubiously low carbon intensity scores, and SRE-induced widening of the D5, D6 RIN spread, all of these things conspired to cause more than 200 million gallons of Brazilian ethanol to flow into California ports. The result of this policy, regulatory, and marketplace turmoil was a lingering supply-demand imbalance, record stocks levels, and extremely challenging economics. Not surprisingly, the industry had no choice but to significantly throttle back production. And at what one point last year, we had as many as 20 ethanol plants shut down or idled. And in the fall, we saw weekly output rates fall to a four-year low. So as we look out that rear window at 2019, it appears that we had a lot of crooked windrows uh, behind us. It was indeed a challenging year. But we kept our focus forward and we continued to look ahead. We made adjustments and course corrections. We kept working to straighten things out. Even with the downturn in production, the ethanol industry continued to serve as a vital source of good paying jobs and economic activity in hard hit rural communities in 2019. Overall, the industry supported nearly 69,000 direct jobs, another 280,000 indirect or induced jobs. We contributed $43 billion to the U.S. gross domestic product, raised household incomes by more than $23 billion, and generated $8 billion in federal, state, and local tax revenue. Ethanol also continued to enhance our energy security, which is something we've been talking about here this morning replacing the amount of gasoline refined from 559 million barrels of imported crude oil and keeping $30 billion or more in the U.S. economy. And let's not forget that 2019 also saw the industry finally achieve a longstanding regulatory objective, RVP parity for E15 and the ability for retailers to finally sell E15 all year long. This victory was made possible because we stayed focused and seized on the opportunity to finally get year-round E15 across the finish line. Already the marketplace is responding, and in fact a, a new analysis that RFA released last week shows that E15 sales set a new record of 500 million gallons 
in 2019. And E15 sales during the summer were more than double the volume that was sold during the summer of 2018. So to celebrate the removal of the summertime prohibition on E15, President Trump himself visited RFA member company, Southwest Iowa Renewable Energy, in June in Council Bluffs. It was only the fourth time in history that a sitting U.S. president had visited an ethanol plant. And not only did President Trump learn more about E15 and the ethanol industry that day, but he also heard directly from farmers and plant workers about the devastating impacts of EPA's small refinery exemptions. In a particularly pivotal moment, Iowa farmers Kevin Ross and Daryl McAlexander told President Trump directly that EPA's small refinery waivers could undermine the E15 victory. And I have no doubt that their comments were on the President's mind when in September President Trump directed EPA to fix this SRE mess once and for all. Kevin Ross, who, who happens to be the, the current president of NCGA, and he's here in the audience somewhere today, uh, was just a rock star that day. And, and when I called Kevin last May to see if he wanted to be among the group of, of farmers that met with the president, he didn't hesitate. He said, of course, I'll be there, count on it. And, and so when you see Kevin in the hallway during a break or at the reception this evening, uh, give him a pat on the back, shake his hand, and, and tell him thank you, because that conversation was, was fundamental. And after a frenetic burst of activity in the last few weeks of 2019, it became clear we were definitely heading in the right direction as the year came to, the tank came to a close. All of the following things happened within the course of just seven days in mid-December. First, President Trump announced that a long-awaited trade deal with China had finally been reached, and officials confirmed that phase one of this deal would, would include purchase agreements for both U.S. ethanol and distiller's grains. Also that week, EPA published its final rule for 2020 RFS blending obligations. And while that rule didn't adopt the small refiner exemption reallocation method that we preferred, it marked a huge improvement over the original proposal and it does give us an outside chance of finally achieving the full 15 billion gallon requirement established by law in 2020. EPA also withdrew its proposed rule that would have reset the 2021 and 2022 RFS volumes. That's a good thing because EPA was again relying on outdated information and bad data to inform those reset volumes uh, that were going to be proposed in that rule. EPA also said it would revisit a court order to restore 500 million gallons of illegally waived RFS requirements from 2016, after initially sort of thumbing their nose at that court order. The administration also committed to greater investment in biofuels infrastructure and streamlining the remaining regulatory barriers that keep E15 from expanding more broadly in the marketplace. The House finally passed USMCA, uh, breaking a logjam and setting up quick passage in the Senate and, and uh, ratification. And lastly, Congress passed and the President signed a spending bill that extended key biofuel tax provisions. So all that happened in seven days while people were doing their Christmas shopping and maybe not paying close attention to what was going on in D.C. Uh, so I'd say that was a pretty good week for our industry. And although all of those events occurred in just seven days, they were months or years in the making and they wouldn't have happened without our industry maintaining, maintaining its focus and tenacity. Now, as 2020 has begun, we've picked up even more momentum. In just the first few months of, of the year, we have uh, seen final ratification of USMCA. We've seen more details on the China Phase One Agreement and visible progress on USDA's biofuels infrastructure program. But the best news of the new year by far came late in the afternoon on Friday, January 24th, when the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit published a bombshell 99-page decision finding that EPA vastly exceeded its statutory authority in granting three specific small refinery exemptions. That, dec that decision stems from a lawsuit that was filed by RFA, the National Corn Growers Association, the American Coalition for Ethanol, and the National Farmers Union all the way back in May of 2018 
just shortly after we became aware that former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt had been secretly issuing dozens of exemptions to his buddies in the refining sector. Our suit challenged EPA's issuance of, of 2016 SREs to three specific refineries, CVR's facility in Winniewood, Oklahoma, and Holly Frontier's facilities in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Woods Cross, Utah. And in a nutshell, and you're going to hear a lot more about this, the court affirmed what we've been saying now for two years. One, that EPA exceeded its authority by granting new small refinery waivers that were not extensions of existing exemptions. Two, that EPA abused its discretion by failing to consider that refiners pass their RFS compliance costs on to their customers. And three, that EPA exceeded its authority by granting SREs based on hardships not caused by RFS compliance. So again, the court vacated these three exemptions and remanded them back to EPA for further action. And we expect this decision will ultimately apply broadly to EPA's actions regarding all small refinery exemptions moving forward. You'll hear a lot more about that court decision and what it means for the ethanol industry from our next speaker right after the break, uh, Matt Morrison, who was the lead attorney for our coalition in this landmark litigation. So while there, was, there were plenty of dark clouds hanging over the industry in 2019, whenever those clouds parted and the light came through, we took full advantage of the opportunity. We made hay while the sun was shining. But focusing forward means more than just looking a few inches in front of your face. Indeed, it's been said that short-sightedness is no better than blindness. And as Helen Keller put it, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. We've got to have vision. We've got to remain focused on the horizon and take the long view. Not only are we starting a new year, but we're starting a new decade. Where do we want to be as an industry in five years? Where do we want to be in 10 years? How will we get there? What is our vision for the future? These are questions that were recently posed to and discussed by RFA's board of directors during a strategic planning process. And we emerged from those discussions with distinct strategic objectives and a clear-eyed vision for the future. And as we discussed the best way to position ethanol in a rapidly changing world and a dynamic marketplace, we kept coming back to three intrinsic values that ethanol offers more affordably than any other fuel on the planet. Clean octane, carbon reduction, and consumer choice, which is really just another way of saying competition, which was something our, our previous speaker talked about. So not long after I started working at the National Corn Growers Association in, in 2003, I was asked by the boss to go give a presentation on ethanol to a group of local agribusiness leaders in, in, in the St. Louis area. And as I was planning for that presentation, I confessed that I'm, I really, I'm kind of new to this ethanol thing. I really don't know much about ethanol. And I was told, don't worry, just remember the three E's whenever you're talking about ethanol's advantages. Energy security, economic development, and environmental benefits. Stick to the three E's and you'll, just, you'll, you'll be just fine. And indeed, the three E's have successfully typified ethanol's benefits over the past several decades. They have served us well, and they will continue to do so as we share ethanol's good story with the public and with policymakers. But as we focus more acutely on positioning ethanol in discussions about energy and climate change, we need to play to ethanol's unique strengths and emphasize the three C's. And again, that's clean octane, carbon reduction, and consumer choice. And I want to spend just a little bit more time looking at each of these. You know, I think first it is already well understood that ethanol has tremendous value as an octane booster. Of all the options available to refiners, ethanol unquestionably has the highest blending octane number and is available at the lowest cost. And you're gonna hear more about ethanol's competitiveness as an octane source later today from, from Argus. But ethanol has been used for decades to boost octane. But moving forward, much higher octane will be needed to enable greater fuel economy and significantly reduce emissions. Numerous studies, whether they're from the automakers or from the Department of Energy, uh, have shown that the use of high octane fuels in the range of 98 to 100 RON in high compression engines 
can greatly improve fuel efficiency and reduce both criteria pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. And this is exactly why automakers view the use of a high octane fuel in optimized engines as a low cost pathway to compliance with those future fuel economy standards that Mr. McNally was referring to uh, that are also emission standards. Uh, not that long ago, GM executive Dan Nicholson, who was actually on this stage a year ago, said higher octane is necessary for better engine efficiency. And he said it is a proven low cost enabler to low CO lower CO2 emissions. And at that time he said 100 Ron fuel is the right fuel for the 2020 to 2025 timeframe. We agree, we have got to get more octane and we need to get there quickly. But here's the thing, as you see on this chart, not all octane boosters are created equal. Refiners really have two choices. They can choose ethanol, a clean renewable octane source, or they can choose aromatics and other hydrocarbon octane boosters, many of which endanger human health and worsen air pollution. And our friends at Urban Air Initiative have done such excellent work to shine a public spotlight on the dangers of aromatics. But in the scientific community, the health impacts of aromatics are already well known. Researchers have tied the microscopic particles and other toxics in exhaust to autism, cancer, asthma, heart disease, and lung disease. And it's the aromatics like benzene that are the major precursors to many of those lethal pollutants. So yes, we need higher octane, but we simply cannot trade higher octane and greater engine efficiency for worse air quality and increased risk to human health and the environment. The choice is simple. And in fact, the choice is unmistakable. Ethanol is the only reasonable and responsible option for raising octane in the future. Second, ethanol is a low cost and readily available tool for reducing carbon emissions from the transportation sector. As we enter a new decade, state and federal action on carbon reduction appears imminent and inevitable. Transportation has emerged as the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the US and thus lawmakers are especially interested in policy solutions that can reduce the carbon intensity of our fuels and vehicles. We're only halfway through the 116th Congress and already we've seen more than 40 legislative proposals and resolutions introduced to tackle climate change or reduce carbon emissions. We've seen everything from the provocative Green New Deal to carbon capture and sequestration measures and lots of other ideas. And while few, if any, of these proposals are expected to go anywhere immediately, their sponsors are sending a clear message. Legislative action aimed at curbing carbon emissions and combating climate change is coming. And it isn't just in the halls of Congress that climate change is dominating policy discussions. It's on the presidential campaign trail as well. In fact, every Democratic candidate running for president says reducing carbon emissions is a top priority. And indeed, thanks to the good work of Biofuels Vision 2020, uh, an organization that, that we support and has worked to determine every candidate's position on renewable fuels, each of the top six candidates coming out of Iowa are on record as supporting ethanol as a way to fight climate change. Frankly, <laughs> a Biofuels Vision 2020 may have been the only thing that worked this year in the Iowa caucuses. Sorry, is that too soon, Monty? Sorry about that. <laughs> the escalating political discourse around climate change is merely a reflection of the fact that people are talking about the issue more than ever before. And so where does that leave us in the ethanol industry? How do we fit into that discussion? You know, some misinformed critics argue that agriculture and ethanol are part of the climate problem rather than part of the climate solution. We cannot let others define our future. Whether we are at the table or on the menu for the climate debate is entirely up to us. And from RFA's perspective, we should not just be at the table for that conversation, we should be helping to lead that conversation. With ethanol, we don't have to wait and hope for major technological or economic breakthroughs. The fuel is available now at a low cost to help drive decarbonization. 
the Department of Energy, California Air Resources Board, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and many others already recognize that grain-based ethanol reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 35 to 50 percent compared to gasoline today. And emerging technologies promise to boost that reduction to around 70 percent in the next few years, according to USDA. And while ethanol's carbon footprint is shrinking, gasoline's carbon footprint is growing larger. And you can see that on this chart. Even with an exaggerated penalty for hypothetical land use change emissions, the latest data from CARB shows that ethanol used in the state of California is reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 40% compared to gasoline. Further, the data show that ethanol is responsible for 40% of total greenhouse gas reductions achieved under the LCFS since the program began in 2011. And that is more than any other low carbon fuel used under the program. RFA is already actively engaged in many initiatives and discussions to ensure that ethanol's carbon benefits are proper, properly represented and understood. In addition to continuing our work to solidify and expand ethanol's role under existing LCFS programs, in California and Oregon, we are working with stakeholders in Washington, New York, Colorado, and other states where similar programs are being investigated or developed. And we have collaborated with a diverse group of stakeholders on a potential clean fuel standard for the Midwest. And you're going to learn more about that effort from a panel of experts later today, along with other perspectives on how ethanol can help decarbonize our transportation sector. So third, going back to that third C of the three C's, ethanol enables greater competition and consumer choice. And it has always been well understood that competition reduced costs for consumers, it spurs innovation, and it stimulates the invention of new products and more efficient processes. In fact, a competition driven by the RFS is responsible for reducing gas prices by at least 22 cents per gallon in recent years according to a new analysis by economist Phil Verlager. But here's the problem, and I, I think uh, Mr. McNally illustrated this quite well. Not everyone likes competition, and not everyone likes the idea of contending for market share on a level playing field. And so whether it is protectionist trade barriers, whether it's century-old subsidies, whether it's branding agreements that prohibit competition, whether it's the erection of regulatory obstacles, incumbent industries will stop at nothing to protect their markets and stifle disruptive technologies and innovation. That's why the notion of a free market is a myth. And that's why the RFS is so important and will remain important in the new decade. The RFS is not a mandate. The RFS, frankly, is the only tool we have that provides renewable fuels access to a market that is otherwise closed to competition. Uh, let, let's, let's be honest here. I mean, if we truly had a free market, wouldn't consumers choose the lower cost, lower carbon, higher octane, biodegradable, American-made option every single time? Of course they would. So that's why we must continue to fight for policies that provide market access and tear down artificial barriers to expanded ethanol use around the globe. Andrew Carnegie, who happened to be an oil man himself, who said it best. He said, while the law of competition may sometimes be hard for the individual, it is best for the race. When there is competition, consumers win, period. Let us compete. That's all we're asking for in the ethanol industry. Let us compete. So how do we take the three C's and translate them into actionable policy that truly expands the market for ethanol reduces emissions, ena enables greater fuel efficiency, enhances competition, and lowers prices at the pump. At RFA, we think we do that with a low carbon octane standard. And as we write the next chapter of renewable fuels policy, RFA and its allies believe ethanol has a tremendous opportunity to serve as the key ingredient of a future high octane, low carbon fuel that delivers significant benefits to American consumers. So you're probably asking at this point, well, what is a low carbon octane standard? How would it work? What does it look like? There's really two key features to the program or the concept that, that we're talking about here. 
A low carbon octane standard establishes a minimum octane standard for gasoline, preferably at the 98 RON level. level. Notice I didn't say it has to be at 98 RON, but again, all the research we've seen suggests that's the right place to start. And number two, it establishes a requirement that the octane boost comes from sources or processes that reduce life cycle greenhouse gas emissions compared to hydrocarbon alternatives. The program would also include provisions to remove or repair problematic regulatory barriers, including ensuring parity in the regulation of volatility for all ethanol blends, improving EPA's fuel certification process, and substantially revising and updating EPA emissions modeling tools. In addition, the policy would stimulate competition and flexibility by compelling the transition of retail infrastructure to accommodate higher ethanol blends like E25 or E30. And finally, the, the program would restore the incentive for automakers to build more flex fuel vehicles and engines optimized for higher blends of ethanol. So if these provisions look familiar, it's because a year ago, I stood up and presented RFA's game plan. All of these uh, objectives were on it. And while we're still in the early innings, I am pleased to report that we are executing on that game plan and we're putting some runners on base. I mean, did you really think I could get through this without a baseball analogy? I mean, I, I, I can't help myself, I'm sorry. Uh, but we are actively engaged in discussions with lawmakers, legislative council, and regulators around a low carbon octane standard. We're doing the legal work, we're doing the economic analysis, we're having the conversations. And we're working to broaden that coalition of supporters for a high octane, low carbon fuel standard. And you're gonna hear a lot more about our efforts uh, in the coming year around uh, making this vision a legislative reality. Clean octane, carbon reduction, and consumer choice. Those are the keys to ethanol's future, but achieving that vision and realizing ethanol's full potential is going to take teamwork, resolve, flexibility, ingenuity, and lots of focus. So as the new decade begins, let's keep our focus forward, let's keep our eye on the horizon, and let's make some hay. Thank you very much.